Hare Krishna Hare. devotees, please accept my humble obeisance to all the Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to today's morning class. Um, today we are starting a new canto and a new chapter. So I hope everyone is excited to looking forward to hearing more nectar. The chap the, the canto is entitled The Cosmic Manifestation. And the invoke the chapter one is entitled The First Step in God Realization. And we are going to be reading from the invocation, which is really, really, really powerful. And we are so happy to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to you and Prabhupada. Uh, uh, Basins to all the devotees. Go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So this is the invocation. Not every canto has an invocation, but this is significant because now Sukadev Goswami steps in a, in a big way to respond to a lot of the, the questions that come up with Maharaj Pariksit. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Translation O oh my Lord, the all-pervading personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Report. Vasudev means to Krishna, the son of Vasudev. Simply by chanting the name of Krishna, Vasudev, one can achieve all the good results of charity, austerity and penance. It is under, understood that by the chanting of this mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, the author or the speaker or any one of the readers of Srimad Bhagavatam is offering respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord Krishna, the reservoir of all pleasure. In the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the principles of creation are described, and thus the first canto may be called Creation. <clears throat> Similarly, in the second canto, the post-creation cosmic manifestation is described. Could you slightly make the uh, font a little larger? Oh, man, it's a little, it's a strain to see this font here. Okay, good. That's good. <clears throat> Similarly, in the second canto, the post-creation cosmic manifestation is described. Different planetary systems are described in the second canto as different parts of the universal body of the Lord. For this reason, the second canto may be called the cosmic manifestation. There are 10 chapters in the second canto, and in these 10 chapters, the purpose of Srimad Bhagavatam and the different symptoms of this purpose are narrated. <clears throat> the first chapter describes the glories of chanting, and it hints at the process by which the neophyte devotee may perform meditation on the universal form of the Lord. In the first verse, Sukadeva Goswami replies to the questions of Maharaj Pariksit, who asked him about one's duty at the point of death. Maharaj Pariksit was glad to receive Sukadeva Goswami, and he was in the end. And he was proud of being a descendant of Arjun, the intimate friend of Krishna. Personally, he was very humble and meek, but he expressed his gladness that Lord Krishna was very kind to his grandfathers, the son of Pandu, especially his own grandfather, Arjun. And because Lord Krishna was always pleased with Maharaj Pariksit's family, at the verge of Maharaj Pariksit's death, <clears throat> Sukadeva Goswami was sent to help him in the process of self-realization. Maharaj Pariksha was a devotee of Krishna from his childhood, <clears throat> and so he had natural affection for Krishna. Sukadeva Goswami could understand his devotion, therefore he welcomed the questions about the king's duty. Because the king hinted that worship of Lord Krishna is the ultimate function 
of every living entity, Sukadev Goswami welcomed the suggestion and said, because you have raised questions about Christian, Krishna, Krishna, your question is most glorious. The translation of the first verse is as follows. ृपाणिपचारिणे <coughs> Vanshakalpa Tarubescha Kripa Sindhuve Bacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Shivasati Gaur Bhakta Vindam <coughs> Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare before we begin, we should mention that this uh, mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, was the Maha Mantra in the age of Dwapara Yuga. That was chanted quite often, <clears throat> as it says here, especially to invoke and the mercy of the Lord and to glorify the Lord in his position as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, here we get a little description of the up and coming canto. Uh, Prabhupada doesn't go into it very deeply, but in this canto, although it's a short canto, there's only one canto that's shorter than this one, and that's the 12th canto. <clears throat> this is the second of the shortest canto. <clears throat> I just finished uh, studying the second canto just recently. Um, it took me much longer than I thought, considering the, the, the less amount of verses compared to the other cantos. But I found that it was so packed with philosophical teachings that I had to go really slow and very, um, what we say, attentive, especially to what was being said. I had to go back over and over again to really understand it's deep in philosophical teachings. In this canto also, it, it mentions that the, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, we have the four nutshell verses in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, 10, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Here, you got the four nutshell verses in the second canto here in the ninth chapter, the second to the last chapter, I think it's verses 33, 34, 35, and 36. <clears throat> and some of the purports are really <clears throat> quite lengthy <laughs> and very deep in philosophical explanations of the nature of the absolute truth. And there's a nice discussion between Lord Brahma and <clears throat> uh, I believe it's Narada Muni also towards the end of the canto. Lord Brahma is explaining his relationship with the Lord and what he had to do in order to become Lord Brahma. <clears throat> uh, so these are some of the more powerful points of this particular uh, chapter. But here we see uh, the importance of chanting mantras. <laughs> uh, mantra, mantra, Man means mind, and tra means to deliver. Mantra is powerful, and when the mantras are chanted properly, with proper pronunciation, and with proper, yeah, explanation, uh, what we say, not explanation, but proper, ex ex yeah, uh, what we say, acclamation, or, in other words, with, proper mood, in the proper mood, those those mantras can move, will move 
the spiritual energy and material energy to give a particular result based on the type of mantra. Just like we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So it's a series of words, but these words are transcendental. They're the names of the absolute truth. And they're aligned in a certain way to give the effect of the glories of the holy name. And one is chanted with attention, devotion, and proper knowledge of the mantra. This is also important. We, we, when we chant mantras, we should know what the mantra means and not simply just chant the mantra. The knowledge of the mantra helps to awaken also the, the effect of the mantra. <clears throat> and also the, the source of the mantra also. So mantra is uh, the means by which one can move oneself further along in the process of uh, devotional service. We see the Acharyas and also Srila Prabhupada very much would chant mantras. There are many, many recorded uh, episodes of Srila Prabhupada just chanting uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna book, and others. Prabhupada would just chant the different mantras uh, that were aligned in these particular texts. Mm -hmm. And this is a good practice for the devotees to get into, to chant mantras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful and very much elevating in consciousness. So, and, as far, and if we practice chanting many mantras, there's different mantras we should chant. Of course, many of the mantras are in the forms of prayers, such as the Shringa prayers and the prayers to the Panchatattva. All of these are mantras also, Panchatattva mantra. Uh, there's there's mantras for every deity also. Those who do deity worship know that, in, in, especially in particularly in temples, there is a mantra that aligns itself with each of the deity as you offer the article, the sacred article, to the deity. And there's both the mula mantra for the deity, and there is a mantra also for the different articles that are offered to the deity. And so especially in deity worship, mantras are very much uh, what we say employed in order to go deeper into the mood of devotion in relationship to the process, process, process of worship. A mantra is very important. Um, now in the second canto, what we'll start to hear is the response very is very in the beginning, the, the response by Sukadev Goswami to Maharaj Pariksit's question. And he glorifies the question before he even gives the response. And the question is, what is the duty of a man about to die? Maharaj Pariksit is under the influence of a very short time left. He only has one week before he is destined to leave the body. So he's asking that question, but Sukadev Goswami glorifies the question in such a way as he says that actually your question is beneficial for everyone. It's the most important question that one can possibly ask. What is the duty of a person about to die? Because everyone is about to die. As long as we have a material body, the death element will is there. And that, is, that is, we call it the time element. So everyone is under the influence of time, and time ends this uh, sojourn of this body and this material world in due course. <clears throat> so one who is actually intelligent and is interested in their own best, who, who has interest in their own best interest, you might say, <clears throat> will ask that question, what is my duty in life? <laughs> or another question is, why do I have to die? Why do I have to get old? Why, why do I have to undergo so much tribulations living in this material world? What is the reason? 
very intelligent questions, the basis of understanding the purpose of life and how to achieve that purpose. Hardly anyone's asked that question. They also are asking, as Prabhupada said, market questions. What's the price of this item in the market? What is the, uh, you know, what is the best way to, you know, arrange my material life? <laughs> they ask all kinds of questions that are related to the body. But nobody's asking the actual real question, who am I? And why do I have to undergo all this suffering? Why is death forced upon me? I don't want it. <laughs> Nobody wants to die, but yet everyone has to leave this body, which is called the end of the body. And we label that by the word death. So uh, it, these are most important questions. And that awakens the understanding of what is the purpose of life because no one knows the purpose of life. Everyday people in this material world, they think, well, the purpose of life is to get a good position, to have a nice family, to celebrate one's successes in material life, maintaining children, relatives, uh, so many purposes that people line themselves in but nobody knows the real purpose of life. And they base their purpose on this body. But then who am I? <laughs> the question is, who am I? And hardly anyone is asking that question. One who does, that you will see, Sukadev Goswami gets quite animated when he hears the question by Maharaj Pariksit. He is very enthusiastic and he glorifies the questionnaire in such a way as to say, this is the best of all questions. <clears throat> and he thanks him for asking that question. A certainly person wants to give that answer because they live simply to give that answer to others. And therefore, Maharaj Pariksit, he knows what to ask. <clears throat> and then once he asks the question, the answers come. And the whole Bhagavatam, goes on with questions and answers between Maharaj Parikshit and Sugadeva Goswami. There are other dialogues within the Bhagavatam also. There's dialogues between Narada Muni and Lord Brahma. There's dialogues between Narada Muni and <clears throat> Yudhisthira Maharaj. And there's so many dialogues in there, but the narration is going on in a, on another level by Sugadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. Uh, so this um, this second canto really opens up. And for those who are very materialistic, who have some idea that there is a supreme, but have no understanding or no real inquiry into who is the supreme or what is the supreme, there's a qualitative description in terms of the amount of time and effort that Sukadeva Goswami spends on describing the universal form. Because the universal form, as it's mentioned here by Srila Prabhupada, is for the neophyte. For those who don't have any understanding of the personality of Godhead, they can imagine uh, the, the universe as being the form of the body of the Lord and the different parts or the different situations, different planets, whatever else is within the universe, are different features on the body of the transcendental Lord in an imaginary sense of a form. And this way they can worship the Lord as the universal form. It's not for devotees who practice Krishna consciousness. These are for, for people who are somewhat materialistic, but still have some tendency towards the worship of the Supreme. So that that that's there. That discuss that discussion goes on, and it comes up at different times within the narration of the second canto. And there's a particular section where there is a detailed, very detailed description of the different parts of the body and the corresponding planets and situations in the universe, which will relate to the different parts of the universal form. 
Uh, but it's nice to know for those of the, those who do preaching, they can help help very materialistic people get a little bit connected to God in his in his imaginary form as the universe. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the uh, ingredients in this uh, the second canto. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a whole section called the Lord of the Heart, one particular chapter which is really deep and interesting into the, the science of bhakti. And so we're, we're getting, <clears throat> we're moving along because as, as it says here, the first canto was creation. The, sub, the second canto is called sub-creation or the <clears throat> manifestation of of creation done by Lord Brahma. The original creation was done by the, the Supreme Lord. And the sub-creation was enunciated by Lord Brahma, who heard directly from Krishna, Taini Brahma Hidayadi Kavaliye. That's mentioned in the first canto. So Bhagavatam is very scientific in giving understandings of the creation and the details of that creation and how it is actually quite amazing. In the fifth canto, you'll get into a whole elaborate description of the creation. And it's impossible to understand because it is way beyond our, our ability to, to, uh, to relate to many of these statements there because <clears throat> these are things that are unique in our life, and these are things that science and modern day, you know, religionists have no understanding of. <laughs> but Bhagavatam, as it says, one of the one of the last chapters in this second canto is called Bhagavatam is the answer. It is the last chapter, in fact. It answers all the questions that one may uh, um decide to ask in relationship to the creation and the sub-creation. <laughs> so I studied the Bhagavatam and I started with the third canto. And I went from third canto all the way up to the 12th canto. Then I went back to do the first and I just finished the second canto about, about a week ago just ending to fit in the last parts of the second canto. And I can say that I really am glad I took that procedure that way because in the second canto, it helped me understand a lot of what I had been exposed to in the other cantos because it's very, very philosophical and in terms of the creation. And this second canto is the foundation for understanding many of the uh, preceding cantos, and one, not preceding, but the one, upcoming cantos, especially the 10th canto. <clears throat> because Krishna is mentioned here as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is known as Vasudev. He is the son of Vasudev. You can see the spelling is slightly different. There is an emphasis over the first A, that is Vasudeva. And then there's Vasudeva. So that is the son of Vasudev is Vasudev, which is Krishna. And he is that same Supreme Personality of Godhead who appeared, who appears in the 10th canto as the son of Vasudev and Devaki. And to understand Krishna's, or to get an insight to understand Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, we must have a working knowledge of Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead because those who simply jump to the 10th canto will uh, misunderstand who Krishna is and why he performs his activities the way he does. They, they may look like ordinary activities and sometimes people do that. They go to the 10th canto they see what Krishna does, and then they perform the same activities on the material level, or at least they try to. And therefore, they, they become imitation. Uh, they, be, they imitate the Supreme Lord when they have no position to imitate the Supreme Lord because they are simply a, a fallen soul in this material world. 
because Krishna's pastimes, particularly in the tenth canto, are fully transcendental and have no material tinge in it at all. But unless one gets a working knowledge of Krishna as the source of all existence, Ishvara Parma Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha Anadirada Govinda Sarvanakarana Karna Karna. This knowledge is foundational, so one will not misunderstand Krishna's leelas in the tenth canto. That same person who is performing various intimate pastimes with his friends in Vrindavan, apparently like an ordinary boy or an ordinary child, is that same person who is the source of all existence and the power of, of behind all of, behind all of creation. So that's important to understand. That's why these, especially the first, second, and third canto are so fundamental for, for understanding the, the absolute truth in his feature as Krishna in the, uh, in the uh, tenth canto. <clears throat> And that is actually the understanding given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Srila Prabhupada has mentioned no other either incarnation or uh, saintly person has ever exposed Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan in such a detailed way and made it available for the ordinary jivas except Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> He wants to give the highest to any, anyone. He makes the highest available to anyone and everyone. But we have to qualify. And the, the Bhagavatam, the nine, the, the preceding nine cantos, uh, are help us come to the philosophical and devotional qualifications to enter into the tenth canto, which is the heart of Krishna, which is the essence of the Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> And so the second canto is very, very uh, important for those who are practicing Krishna consciousness and want to understand deeper what is this process and how one actually understands their relationship with the Supreme Lord through this process of bhakti. Um, yeah, so... Um, I'm happy to be able to have an opportunity to speak about this invocation. It's interesting. It's uh, <clears throat> Prabhupada makes that, uh, well, the acharyas bring that invocation. You don't find it in any of the other chapters, although there is some preceding descriptions of the chapters in starting with the, uh, I think it's the sixth canto. Before that, there is no preceding statements in any of the chapters except this one invocation here in the second second canto, which covers all of the ten chap chapters here. And also in this um, second canto, there is, I think it's the second canto, uh, tenth chapter, verse number one. It describes what are the ten... Uh, topics that are covered by Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam covers 10 very important philosophical teachings, uh, creation, sub-creation, movement of the living entities, the, the uh, protection by the Lord, the Manus, the incarnations, the various, and ultimately Krishna in the in the 10th canto as the Asraya of the supreme shelter of all of the other nine subject matters. <laughs> so make a study of Bhagavatam, make it your life to study this Bhagavatam, and you will be amazed. And also you'll be you'll so you'll go be able to go deep in this process of Krishna consciousness, which is so deep in philosophical knowledge and transcendental experiences that comes by way of transcendental knowledge and by practicing devotional service to the Lord under the guidance of the Lord's pure devotee, the spiritual master. <clears throat> okay.
Thank you so much, Marge. It's I'm also very happy that you are able to speak on the invocation. And yes, when I read this, um, like you mentioned, there aren't other cantos I've known that has this really detailed invocation. So thank you so much for setting the tone for us. If you can stop sharing. And I will uh, request devotees, if you're able to please turn on your videos wherever you're at so that we can take each other's association. If there are any questions, um, please, questions, comments, clarification, please uh, uh, do raise your hand and I will call you in the order. Or you can put the question in the chat and I'll be happy to read it. Marge, um, I have a question, Marge, and that is, interestingly, which I did not know, that you said that in the age of Dwarpa, that the Maha Mantra was O Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Was there other mantras in the other yugas, Maharaj, that's different from this? Just curious. Yeah, every yuga has the mantra. <clears throat> it may not be the Maha Mantra, but Prabhupada specifically says this. This is in the lecture. He says this This is the man was the Maha Mantra in the Tapura Yuga. With every age, there are mantras for chanting. Of course, in the Treta Yuga, the whole the whole process of self realization was based on Agni Hotra, which was sacrifices, chanting the mantras regarding how to execute the proper uh, sacrifices. <clears throat> so, mantra chanting in those age <clears throat> was was perfectly done by Brahmins who were highly qualified to chant the mantras. And these, as the ages become more and more to the present age, we find the Brahmins are not as qualified as they were in the previous ages. And so <clears throat> uh, you'll find that a lot of the mantras are not being chanted anymore because there are no qualified Brahmins for chanting. Just like, the, I think it's the what is it? The Rig Veda is full of mantras. Uh, the different Vedas. <clears throat> and they're all mantras, practically. All of the verses are just mantras. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, in the Satya Yuga, um, there is a particular mantra that was mentioned. It's not can, can call, called the Maha Mantra, but it's a mantra that was chanted. <clears throat> by those who are practicing devotion. Uh, it slips my mind now what that mantra was in the Satya Yuga. Um, of course, there is an incarnation for every age in the Satya Yuga. It was Lord Kapiladev. <clears throat> in the Treta Yuga, it's called the Red Incarnation of the Lord. Uh, he's called... Oh, what is his name? <clears throat> Can't remember. And he's red in color. Um, first, he, first is white, then red, then dark. Krishna is the incarnation in Dwarpura Yuga, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in in this Yuga. <laughs> so yeah, there is incarnations, manifestations of the Godhead that are worshipped. <laughs> along with mantras. Excuse me. Maharaj, Madan Gopal put a post saying, is it Hamsa? Yeah, and... I'm also thinking Hamsa. But, but anyway. Hamsa, incarnation? The red yeah. color. Um, I'm, not, I'm not, it might be, but I, I can't say for sure. Thank you, Marge. I was just curious because I did not know that Dwar in Dwarfa Yuga they had their own mantra. So that was definitely knowledge for me. Thank you. Well, it's just a, you have to understand how it was used. Mm. Because in Dwarfa Yuga, the process for self realization was deity worship. Mm. And so there were, there's also mantras that accompany all forms of deity worship. But then again, Prabhupada said, and it's clear, you can look it up. He said this was the Maha Mantra in the preceding age. Oh, you know who chanted that mantra was Dhruva Maharaj. Yeah, Dhruva Maharaj chanted that mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 
Thank you, Marge. Thank you. Yes, Ekta, Prabhu, go ahead. Hi, Krishna Maharaj, please at my home obeisances, Obisha Prabhupada, and my humble obeisances to all the devotees. Um, I wanted to ask, particularly in the first two cantos, um, the term the absolute truth is is described um or is used to describe the Lord. And I wondered if you could share more about um that term. Um, well, there are different levels of truth, but then there is the source of all truth, which is the absolute truth. So sometimes the Supreme Personality of Godhead is described as being the absolute truth, personality of Godhead. So there's only one absolute truth, and that's Sri Krishna. He is the feature of the absolute truth as the person. Sometimes he is called, called the Sunam Bonam the the principle of existence everything is coming from the absolute truth even all of the relative truths so there are many truths but he is the absolute truth the source of all truth that's why you find statements like the absolute truth personality of godhead sri krishna <laughs> so there are many truths, and people will will claim other truths as being the highest truth, but then we have to take the words of the Shastra. That Krishna is the source of all incarnations. They take jam sampalum whom some Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. He is the, the absolute truth. There is no truth greater than Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam. He is that principle by which all manifestations are coming. All living entities are, are coming by him. He is the source of all living entities. No one is equal to and no one is greater to. Sometimes people will say, well, no one's greater, but there are those who are equal. No, it's not like that. He is above all. The, the different characteristics of the of the personalities of Godhead in their different incarnations cannot match with Krishna's uh, unique qualities. And that's mentioned in the Nectar Devotion by Srila Rupa Goswami, that he has pastimes that are unique and, and distinct from every, any other manifestation of incarnation. And he has certain qualities. Now he's surrounded by his loving devotees. There's four particular characteristics that are unique to the absolute truth personality of Godhead Sri Krishna. Mm -hmm. Many times you hear people say Vishnu is the source and Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. But that is not uh, mentioned in Bhagavatam in that way. The Vishnu manifestations appear at a certain time in order to facilitate the, the creation of the material existence. But Krishna is the source of Vishnu also. And if you read the third chapter of the first canto, then it becomes clear that there's no one higher than that. And of course, the first verse, the first three verses, but the first verse, Janmad Yasya Yataha, and the absolute truth is the supreme personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, who is that same person who is the cowherd boy in Sri Vrindavan Dal. So there's so much speculation on the identity of the absolute truth and Krishna's in Krishna's personal identity, but Bhagavatam makes it clear. <laughs> And Krishna also establishes that in the Bhagavad Gita. As he says, Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo Matat Smrta Matir Smrta What is that? Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo Mata Prabhartante Iti Matva Bhajante Mambuddha Bhava So I am the source of all material and spiritual worlds. Everything comes from me. The wise who know this engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. And that is the foundation for the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. 
Gita. One has to know that before one can actually make progress in devotions. There are many manifestations of the absolute truth, but Krishna is the source of all of them. Even the Brahma Samhita enunciate in a Angani Yasya Galansi Avriti Manti Pasyanti Panti Kalyan Jiganti. He is that, um, what is that, that. There are many candles, and but there is one candle which is the source of lighting all of the other candles, and that is Krishna. Although all the other candles may have similar, same power as the original candle, the original candle is the source of the other candles. <clears throat> I hope that helped Ekta Prabhu. Ekta Matri. It's a very, very powerful answer too. Really powerful. Thank you. Any questions from devotees? Please do raise your hand or uh, jump right in. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. I'll be happy to read. Marge, another question I had, Marge, when you were speaking about the universal form and you said that the materialistic people it's you know for them that that would be the best form for them to start worshiping as the materialistic form once a materialistic persons uh do that much do they get quote unquote promoted or get the understanding of going beyond that to the to the actual bhakti yoga or no that's, yeah and that's the foundation for one of them to they won't be able to immediately jump through the process of accepting the personality of Godhead as the Supreme. So therefore, to indicate that the personality has a form, the, the uh, schematic or the, the diagram of the universe in all its detail is formulated in such a way, like his the mountains are his bones, the oceans are his belly, uh, the different, the lower planetary systems are his feet. The higher planetary systems are his head, <clears throat> like that. So, yeah, it gives a understanding that God has a form, but this particular form is imaginary, but at least they can begin to worship on that level. This is just to get them started in worship. So even if it's imaginary much, it still has some benefits to get them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The benefits are there that God does have a form and the universe is his form. <laughs> but it's imaginary. So Marge, uh, let me see. Okay, I, I can ask my next question while others are thinking. So Marge, so when... Krishna showed his universal form to Arjuna on the battlefield. Is it because he wasn't convinced? So he had to see the imaginary form to be convinced? Well, the, the universal form are, are shown in different ways according to the, the person that Krishna is showing it to. They're not all the same. The ingredients that make up the universe is formalized in Krishna's appearance as the universal form. The different, uh, what we say, godly manifestations, the different horrible manifestations are all seen within that universal form. And Krishna did that to, not Arjuna didn't need it. <laughs> Arjuna didn't ask that question for the benefit of all of us. So the people could, un again, understand that, you know, that that same person who was on the battlefield riding on the chariot, not fighting, giving directions, is that same person who's the source of all existence. And we also use that just like someone will say, well, I am an incarnation of God. Then the next question would be, Show me your universal form. 
And then they'll say, well, you're not qualified to see it. And then we say, has anybody seen your universal form? And they'll say, no. And, and uh, then we'll say, well, then you're not qualified because nobody, you can't make anybody qualified to see your universal form, although you're God himself. Mm -hmm. So we can defeat all these, these ideas that people say, well, I am God. And that's why Krishna, that's one of the main reasons Krishna did it, to help us understand that if someone claims to be God, ask them to, to show the universal form. If they say no one's qualified to see it, that means no one, you haven't made anybody qualified, you have no followers. <laughs> You're useless. <laughs> so you have you have different arguments that are presented within the context of the absolute truth to defeat those who present themselves as being God or the incarnations of God. Thank you, Marge. Or even the point if they can lift uh, Govardhan Hill with your pinky <laughs> or Hill with, with your pinky. <laughs> What's that? I missed that. Oh, if or or if they can lift the hill with the pinky. <laughs> yeah, or if, they, or if they want to smoke ganja, they can have to drink an ocean of poison. <laughs> Hare Krishna, that's yeah. We do have the right questions to defeat such, you know, people like that. Yes, yes, Marge. Thank you. Any yeah, questions? I'm sorry, Marge. God has to go to the dentist. So the dentist God is higher than the, the the victim God because he's giving dental repair to the incarnation of God. <laughs> all, of the, all of their arguments are just, and you can see right through them. But yes. people... But because they have some mystic power and they can do some magic, people think, oh, here is the supreme, you know. Thank you, Marge. Thank you. Any questions from devotees, please? Uh, even, you know, comment or wait, I think I heard a voice. Did I hear a voice? Okay. Any questions? Yes, Nita Gopal. Go ahead, Prabhu. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All goes to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much for a wonderful class. Uh, in the starting, Maharaj, you mentioned uh, the main uh, shlokas for the this uh, canto in chapter 9, uh, shlokas from 33 to 36. I was just going through it and uh, I have a question on the shloka number, uh, I think, 34. So, Lord is saying, Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. So, I just I was thinking how we can relate whatever we see, do, or, you know, interact, how we can connect that with the Lord. Because uh, Lord is saying to Brahma, if it is without relation to me, it has no reality, and it is uh, it will be illusory energy. Uh, so just I was thinking on that point, Maharaj. So for a devotee, <clears throat> he learns the science of how to use the material energy in the service of the Lord. Ultimately, the material energy is also called daivi, daiviyesha gunamayi. It's divine. <clears throat> so to be able to connect the features of this illusionary energy in service to the Lord brings that that energy back to its position as being divine. Otherwise, if it's being used in, in to further the material consciousness, it's just, as Krishna says, it's just part of illusion. Reality means something that is permanent, not something that is, comes and goes. Something that comes and goes is not reality. Mm, I see. That's why our bodies are not reality, because they come and go.
but we like our body. We sit in a mirror there for <clears throat> an hour just decorating it. <clears throat> And after we're done, we're still not happy. <laughs> so, this illusion. This is called, you know, Maya means what is not. Maya governs the material world. What is not means it exists, but it's not, it doesn't exist in the way that you see it. It's a shadow. If you see the shadow of the person, it looks, it has the same form as the person, but it's not the person because it's simply an, a reflection. So this world is a reflection of the reality of existence. But if you connect the elements within the reflection to the source, then you bring those elements because they're also created by the Lord back to their their the purpose for the, which they exist so everything is meant for the service of the lord because everything is created by the lord and the and the means of service is the connecting principle between the jiva and the soul and, and the supreme lord we have to in in order to serve the lord we have to offer something and therefore whatever and therefore it says we offer the things of this world especially the things that we are attached to, to Krishna in devotion, and then they become purified. Sarvatma snaparam param vijayate si krishna sankirtanam. Everything becomes purified when it's served. So one's home, one's possessions, one's very body also becomes purified, spiritualized when it's engaged in the service of the Lord. It takes on its actual constitutional position because all the elements that make up the ingredients of the material world are eternal. Earth, water, fire, air, and ether are mind intelligence and false ego are eternal. But they are they change forms according to how they're being used. But you can't, this, even the scientists know that matter cannot be created or destroyed. But the forms can change, that's all. So the forms of the illusion are the illusion, the ingredients are the reality because these elements are created by God himself. <laughs> And everything in the material world is made up of these eight elements. That's why Krishna says, Daivi Asia. Daivi means divine. This material world is divine. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Very nice question, too. Thank you for asking that, Nitagopal. Very nice. Uh, Priksha, go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my whole obeisances. All glory to you, Prabhupada. Thank you for the nice lecture. It's in-depth. Um, I'd like to bring attention again to the absolute truth. And the scripture says, at least in so many places, Sri Prabhupada gives purport that um, the name, Krishna's name is Krishna, Krishna's paraphernalia is Krishna, Krishna's pastimes is Krishna, because he's the absolute truth. And can you shed some more light on it? I know we can't be like that, yeah, true enough, but sometimes that's when, when they say the things of Krishna are also Krishna, the reason is given that because he's the absolute truth. Well, and, yeah, and the absolute truth, everything in relationship to the absolute truth has the same qualities of the absolute truth. Or in the mm -hmm. material world, the, the, this is the world of duality. You can only understand something by the opposite. You can't understand heat without cold, and, uh, uh, dark without light. All of the, everything in this world is, is dualistic. And that's why it's called temporary also, because it changes. But in the absolute sense, 
the uh, any activity or any paraphernalia connected with Krishna in the absolute sense, such as his names, his forms, his qualities, his pastimes, his paraphernalia, his dham, these are all absolute because they are connected with the absolute truth in devotion. So well, how can one understand the nature of absolute? You can't because... You have to experience that. And just like sometimes we get, we start to have some ecstatic experience when we're chanting Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing? We're just sounding the name of the Lord. But the name of the Lord is the Lord. It's non-different. But somehow or other, we've reached a certain level of purification and we can experience some ecstasy. So is that name giving you ecstasy? In a sense, it is because that name is Krishna. Krishna, in the form of the name, is is the experience of the ecstasy. There's a transformation in consciousness coming by the the, the connection with the absolute principle. Same with his pastimes. Same with his qualities, forms. Okay. Yeah, that's a, the absolute. Yeah nature of, of the absolute truth is understood by experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And then in the material world, things are understood because they have opposites. Is that you understand he because that's cool. How can we define things in this world? Good and bad, old and young. <laughs> yeah. You'll see for every every word there is a uh, a a concomitant opposite that describes that same word. Excellent, uh, poor. Mm -hmm. The opposite of excellent would be poor. Every everything you can see in this world is, has an opposite an opposite to it. <laughs> Something porous, what is something opposite of porous is solid. So these are everything is there in the absolute in the it's all relative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. Sri Devi, go ahead, it's yours. Thank you, Ansia. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my most humble obeisances or glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, you just now said about matter that it is eternal, the ingredients that you mentioned make that make up matter. But we always say dead matter. It is the soul which brings life to dead matter. And uh, though I understand in principle that only the forms keep changing and <clears throat> the ingredients, prakriti, is eternal. Why we also say dead matter? Because it, <clears throat> if it's not connected to the source, it remains what is a, what's called jada or inert. Mm -hmm. But it's still, in its essence, it's still spiritual because it comes from the absolute truth. The ingredients that make up matter are the principles of eternality and not this simply the forms. The forms are all changeable. Hmm. No one can can create the ingredients. Those those are created by the Lord Himself. Hmm. And therefore, because this is Krishna's energy, is eternal. Yeah. Just like, this is a very simple thing. You take water, you put it on fire, and you boil it, and it disappears. But what is it changing? You're changing the molecular structure into a gaseous type of substance. So the molecules have changed, but the, the, the essence is still there in the form of gas now. So everything is based on atoms, molecular structures. <laughs> Mm -hmm. just like if there are people who can take their hand and put it through a wall 
because they know the science of how you know how that how they can change matter to make it function in different ways. You can people walk on hot coals and their feet doesn't get burned. You know, so this mm. is mind over matter. That's all. My using the mind to some way manipulate matter. <laughs> The Krishna is the supreme mind, so he's controlling all the matters simply by his will. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. We cannot so, even understand what the spiritual world is like because we're just yeah. used to this material world. We cannot I'll even understand. Yeah, I'll give you a statement which you can't understand, but anyway, that in the spiritual world, people eat. But everything in the spiritual world is eternal. So what happens to what you eat? So you eat the glove jamin and it's still there. It's still there. Yeah. Wow. So I'm just using that as a, as a in a euphemistic way to somehow or other let you understand there's no transformation in the spiritual world, but in the material world, everything is transformed. So how can you understand eternality from the position of temporality? Because <laughs> we we think in the form of beginning and end. <laughs> so how, how uh, we will be prepared for the spiritual yeah. world Excuse unless me, we I'm really sorry. gain the knowledge and the purity and the level of devotion that is necessary for the spiritual world? It's not possible, right? Mm. What's that? What was that question? How, how can we ever get qualified for the spiritual world until we attain that level of purity, devotion, transcendent knowledge, and purification? Because in our present situation, we cannot even understand what the spiritual world is like. Forget about being qualified for it. Very well. Hare <laughs> uh, One minute. Yes, Mahaprabhu, I'm still on my call. I'll be down in a couple minutes. Sure, Maharaj. You're here now? Yeah, I'm here, Maharaj. All right. Yeah, I'll be, I should be there in five minutes. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I'm, unfortunately I have to wind it up because I'm already late for my next engagement. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marge, for making time for us. You always make time no matter how busy you are. When we thank all the devotees for joining us, Vancha Kaptu Biascha, Kripa Sindhu Bevacha, Patitanam Pavane, Bia Vaishnava, Bia Namo Namaha, Shila Prabhupada, Ki, Jai, His Holiness Chandramali Swami, Ki. Thank you very much for today's class. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Thank you. We had a record. Hare Krishna. We had a record, a record number of devotees today. Was, yes, Mark, we hit yeah. 40. No, it's more than that. 40, 41. We hit 41. 41. Yeah. 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 Keep going. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Only by your mercy, Marge. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah.